This is the last little bit here to try to summarize um, what we've been talking about with wave particle duality. So we've talked about how uh, things that we think of as waves, that's light, can behave like a particle. Well, the other half of this discussion is how things that we think of as particles can behave like waves. So we're going to talk about some evidence for the particle nature of waves. We're going to do some uh, calculations on that. And then we're going to do a little summary just to make sure that we've got all the key ideas on wave particle duality. Okay, so it starts from this guy, uh, Prince Louis Edward de Broglie, uh, Broglie, some people say, but officially it should be called Broy. Um, he came out with this idea. He said light, which we thought was a wave, can behave like a particle. So maybe things which we think of as being particles, like electrons, for example, could behave like waves. So this, he did this slightly dodgy derivation. He did it better than we can do it, but it gives us the idea. So he said F equals C over lambda. We all know that. And E equals HF. We know that as well. Also, he'd come across Einstein equation. E equals MC squared. So he said, well, HF is also equal to E, so let's make MC squared equal to HF. Um, let's substitute in C over lambda for F, so we get MC squared equals HC over lambda, cancel out as C, we get MC equals H over lambda. So this is all true for waves, so if we take a particle with a velocity V, we just make the speed of the particle equal to V instead, so we get MV instead of MC equals H over lambda, rearrange that, we get lambda equals H over MV. MV, you'll remember, is momentum, sometimes just given the symbol p. So this wavelength is the wavelength for a particle of mass m going at a velocity v, and it's called a de Broglie wavelength. So that was a great little idea. Could we come out with any evidence? Well, let's think about the practical problems. So here's a person that's just walking along the room. Let's say they're, uh, here's the Planck constant. Say they're 60 kilograms and they're walking at 2 meters per second. What's their wavelength? Well, if you do the maths there, you end up with a wavelength of 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 36 meters. Clearly, this is a very short distance. And the only way we're going to be able to prove it's a wave, really, is diffraction. But if they walk through a doorway, you're not going to notice them being diffraction because you'll remember the key um, condition for diffraction is that the wavelength of the wave is similar to the size of the gap it's traveling through. Okay, so you can't fit through a gap that's 5.5 .5 times 10 to minus 36 meters wide, so you're not actually going to notice this effect on the kind of scale of human beings. How could we do it? Well, we could calculate, we could try it with electrons, so we could get a velocity of electron which is accelerated to 2,000 volts. Let's see how that's going to work. So the kinetic energy of this electron is going to be the voltage accelerated through times the charge. So this comes to this amount of energy. Okay, but we know this kinetic energy is a half mv squared, so half mv squared equals this. So v squared, just do a little bit of algebra on that, and we end up with v squared is 7 times 10 to the 14, which gives us v is 2.7 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. That's nearly a tenth of the speed of light. Calculate the wavelength of that. Well, h over mv again gives us now a wavelength of 2.75 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. This is still a very, very short length. Okay, but we can actually have a look at diffraction with this because what we need is a gap of around that kind of size. Well, the way we do that is that we find something which has a gap of this sort of size, which is the sort of space in between atoms, okay, in a crystal. So this is a practical setup we get. We get um, something to give us some electrons, a cathode. We accelerate that towards an anode with a couple of thousand volts. And then when these electrons are coming th um at this speed, about a tenth of the speed of light, then we put them through some graphite. Hopefully you'll remember the structure of graphite is little hexagonal um, cells all joined together, so it actually forms a bit like a diffraction grating that we'll talk about a bit more later in the year. But the electrons pass through there and are diffracted, and then because they've got so much energy, then they've got enough energy to actually make a screen glow at the end, so you have a fluorescent screen, you make the screen glow and you can see where they've gone. Okay, this is what it really looks like in uh, in practice. So you get a high voltage supply, you accelerate the electrons down here, there's the screen, and on the screen you can just about hopefully see there's a pattern. And if you look at that pattern, it looks at some concentric rings. So in the middle here you've got constructive interference, this ring again here is constructive interference, this ring here is constructive interference. In between those places you've got destructive interference, as soon as you see the idea of destructive interference, hopefully you're thinking, hang on a minute, this is what waves do, not what particles do. So this is evidence for the wave nature of electrons. 
Okay, here's a similar calculation again, just to try it. So the kinetic energy of the electrons have gone through 1.5 kilovolts. So that's just 1,500 electron volts, 1.5 kilo electron volts. Calculate their energy in joules. So we just turn the electron volts into joules by multiplying by our conversion factor here. Calculate the speed. We do half mv squared, do a little bit of rearrangement, and we end up with the speed of 2.3 times 10 to the 7. Do the de Broglie wavelength. Lambda equals h over mv. We end up with a wavelength of 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11. So it turns out that that wavelength is similar to the size of the gaps in between the carbon atoms and the graphite, so we can see that diffraction pattern. Okay, so that's the end of wave particle duality. Just a little summary. What have we learned? Well, what we've learned is wave particle duality is telling us that things that we think of normally as being waves can also behave like their particles, and things that we th normally think of as being particles can behave like waves. Here's a little grid because you might get asked for evidence for that. So why did we think light was a wave? Well, Young's double slit experiment in 1801 was the kind of thought at the time to be the sort of final proof of the answer to that. But then we also find that light can behave like a particle. That's the photoelectric effect. Can't explain the photoelectric effect with a wave model. Can't explain Young's double slit experiment with a wave model. What about electrons? Well, we've just seen the evidence. Electron diffraction is evidence for electrons behaving like waves. Okay, strangely enough, the trickiest one sometimes is to remember how to explain that electro we thought electrons were particles in the first place. But if you think of the calculation we've done with the electron accelerating down the tube, that's very much thinking of the electron as being a little solid object, which is accelerated through a voltage and has got a velocity at the end of it. So electron acceleration in a cathode ray tube is a good piece of evidence for electrons behaving like particles.